Welcome to the New Beginning Celebration. Each and every one of you are greatly appreciated in this place. And welcome those of you who are coming to us by way of social media, our YouTube channel, Facebook. We thank you for joining us, taking time to be present with us on this journey that we're on in Christ Jesus. And we so appreciate everything that you do. Today we're going to talk about something that goes a little bit basic and fundamental with how we're to live. <clears throat> you know, here at New Beginning Celebration, we believe in teaching people how to live in Christ. We don't want to just teach you the basic fundamental tenets of salvation, the elementary principles. You know, the Bible encourages us as believers that we now need to leave from just the basic elementary principles of salvation and baptism. And we've got to grow up. <clears throat> There's some pastors out there that all they know how to preach is for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son and Jesus shed his blood for your life and gave his life for yours and the Holy Spirit's moving in you. And, and, and that's just every Sunday over and over and over and, uh, and over. But what happened to the rest of the Bible that teaches us how to live and grow up? And we've got babes in Christ just floundering around that don't know how to live because all they have to, all they know is that they're saved. And being saved, everything in the package of salvation is there for us to live. It has all been taken care of by Jesus. The penalty of sin, the penalty of death, eternal life is gift wrapped in there. But now I'm just born again. I'm just barely crawling. What am I going to do here at New Beginning Celebration? We believe in teaching you how to crawl, to stand, and then to take steps and walk. Then we teach you how to run. We're going to teach you how to jump. We're going to teach you how to grow facial hair. We're going to teach you how to grow up. You're going to come off of the Gerber jar. And then you're going to cut up some steak. We're going to teach you how to grow. So here we go. Our message today is called Living by the Principle of Seed. This is just the introduction. It's probably going to end up being at least a three-part series. But Living by the Principle of Seed. Everything out there has come from one place of origin, God. And from God, everything that lives, plant or animal, has something that can help reciprocate life, to help reproduce in and of and from itself. God pressed play, and it's happening. We're going to find out just how obedient to that command the botany or plant kingdom is, the animal kingdom, and I'll separate us from the animals, the human kingdom. We're going to find out how this seed or principle of seed works. Seed. What is seed? <clears throat> Why is it so, what is so important about seed? What is in a seed? And what is our role in using seed? Let's get all of our stuff together here. For those of you joining us, just want to let you know, we're just a good old down home. Let's be real. Worship. Celebration group of folks. And that's what we do. We come together to celebrate and to worship Jesus Christ, our Savior and our Lord. That's why we're called New Beginning Celebration because we celebrate all the new beginnings from salvation and you should be experiencing new beginnings every day in your life. Somewhere, somehow, today should not be the same as yesterday. Something I need to learn, something I need to change, something I need to shell off in my life relationships need to start to mend. Things need to change. And there's new beginnings every day. If you live to be 110, 
you should be able to experience new beginnings in your life and celebrate them. Hence, that's why we're called New Beginning Celebration. So we, we're talking about seed planting or living by the principle of seed. That's something new right there. I was out in my yard cutting the grass the other day, and I know I've gone through it in my quest to think I'm going to be a gardener or that person with that green thumb that is usually brown. I got me some weed killer. That kind of weed killer you can spray, and it kills the weed but don't kill the grass. It's good stuff, right? You know, it's anything like that in my earlier years. So, man, I'm throwing down. Grass looked great, beautiful. First time or two that I had to cut it. Now, I went out to cut the grass the other day, and I looked in the yard. Where did that weed come from? Where did that weed come from? And as I looked around the yard, there were other weeds sprouting up in between the blades of grass. And I'm like, wait a minute, man. I killed all y'all. But there was something I didn't get to when I was killing the weed. I didn't kill the seed. So we're going to learn about the principle of seed throughout the course of the next few weeks. And hopefully today we'll answer these and other questions as we learn about seed and God's purpose for seed. As it is the beginning of life of something. And continues to sustain an advancing life in all things living on earth. We will see the planting of seed. That the planting of seed is the purposeful foundation of life. Turn with me to Genesis chapter 1. Y'all already knew we were going there, didn't we? <clears throat> Genesis chapter 1. There's a rule in studying the Bible that many don't understand or know about because once you get down into the later parts of the Bible, the latter parts of Scripture, there are areas in the Bible that can speak of something. And people will try to take and improperly interpret what the Bible is saying based just on the passage as it says it there and go into some place of oh, oh, I think I got my answer. Let me help you understand something. Jesus said that the words that I speak, they are spirit and they are life. The Holy Spirit is going to interpret God's word through and by God's word. The words I speak, they are spirit and they are life. The living word stood there and said that the words, he's the word and the words plural that I speak, they are spirit and they are life. He is the way, the truth, and the life. So the word is saying that everything that the Holy Spirit is going to reveal to you and teach to you is connected to my word. Now he's going to direct the course of action even with the angels that God has sent to help us stay out of trouble or miss any kind of accidents and hindrances to our lives. But don't get the work of the Holy Spirit and the work of the angels mixed up. But he said the word. So we got a rule in theology or in, and if you don't, please don't curse that word because theology is simply the study of God. If you're reading your Bible and studying your Bible, you're studying God. In the beginning was the word, the word was with God, and the word was God, and the word came flesh and dwelt among us. So don't get upset about theology because there are people who are just theologians and not Christians. Well, then that's their problem. But don't run away and throw off something that is really meant for us because some other clown out there has misused it and misinterpreted that. But there's a rule that says the, that is the law of first mention. The law of first mention. So if I'm in the New Testament reading about being the seed of Abraham, if I'm in the New Testament reading about seeing that we were born again by incorruptible seed, not by corruptible seed, but incorruptible seed by the word of God, guess what? If I need to understand a little bit more, let's go back to where it was first mentioned. That's why today we're starting in Genesis. We're just going to go right to the first mention from the start. 
Genesis 1, verse 11. Then God said, let the earth bring forth grass, the herb that yields seed, the fruit tree that yields seed, yields fruit according to its kind, whose seed is in itself on the earth. And it was so. <clears throat> Let's go to verse 20 through 31. <laughs> Then God said, let the waters abound with an abundance of living creatures and let birds fly above the earth across the face of the firmament of the heavens. So God created great sea creatures and every living thing that moves with which waters abounded according to their kind and every winged bird according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. And God blessed them saying, be fruitful and multiply. And fill the waters in the seas and let birds multiply on the earth. So the evening and the morning were the fifth day. Then God said, let the earth bring forth the living creature according to its kind. Cattle and creeping thing and beast of the earth, each according to its kind. And it was so. And God made the beast of the earth. According to its kind, cattle according to its kind, and everything that creeps on the earth according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. Then God said, boy, this is a sweet one here. The other one was sweet because we can get our cheeseburgers from it. Good old <clears throat> fried chicken leg. But this one is real sweet because without this one, we, we ain't even here to eat. Then God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over the cattle, over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image, and in the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Then God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth, and subdue it. Have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, over every living thing that moves on the earth. And God said, see, I have given you every herb, here we go, that yields seed, which is on the face of the earth. And every tree whose fruit yields seed, to you it shall be for food. <clears throat> also to every beast of the earth, to every bird of the air, and to everything that creeps on the earth in which there is life, I have given every green herb for food. And it was so. Then God saw everything that he made, and indeed, it was very good. So the evening and the morning were the sixth day. Let us pray. Father, we thank you this day for your presence. We thank you, Father, that you are God and not anyone else. We thank you because you have allowed us the privilege and the honor to be in your presence and to be in this day that we can be partakers of the divine inheritance that you provided through the shedding of the blood of your son, Jesus Christ. We thank you for that perfect plan of salvation. Father, we couldn't have drawn it up ourselves anywhere close to that, remotely close, but we thank you that you had a plan for the sacrifice, the perfect lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world that we might be saved. Thank you, Father, for choosing us and calling us out from among them and implanting your salvation in us, pricking our hearts, convicting us of sin, and causing us to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ for our salvation. You are awesome. We believe in your word, God, the power of your word. For the Bible says that the gospel is the power of God unto salvation to all who will believe, to the Jew first and then to the Greek. And then you clothe your word, you clothe your gospel in flesh, and you walk the earth, healing and delivering and saving. Bless your name, Jesus. We love you, Lord, today. We ask that you will impart to us all the things that you have planned for us out of your word today. Fill us up with the knowledge of your will and all wisdom and all spiritual understanding that we may walk worthy of your calling and fully pleasing unto you. That we will be nurtured in your word and that we will be brought up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. That we will be beneficial to you and your kingdom, Father, as we walk here on earth. 
revealing to others that which you have purposed and planned for all mankind, and that's salvation. For the Bible says that salvation, the salvation has appeared to all men, that the light of salvation has also appeared unto all men. And we thank you for who you are and what you're doing in our lives. And when we leave this place today, and when those who have joined by way of social media cuts off their devices, may their lives be changed forever and forevermore. We love you and we thank you. Amen. Just to let some of you all know who may be joining us through, again, social media, you don't hear me say in Jesus' name at the end of the prayer. I just want you to understand that the prayers are made in Jesus' name. When we pray God's word, we're praying in Jesus' name. I just wanted to throw that out there as a little nugget. The Bible says that if we ask according to his will, we know that he hears us. And we know that if he hears us, we know that we have the petitions that we have asked of him. In order to pray somebody's will, in order to know somebody's will, you got to read words. When I die... I'm going to leave something called the last will and testament. Hint, hint. To read my will and testament, there's an old and a new testament here. In order to know what God's will is, we've got to read his word. When that lawyer or that attorney sits there with my family members and goes through that will, he's not going to look at them. He's not going to look at an empty desk, but he's going to pick up a document called a will, and on that document is printed words. In order for those who are hearing that being spoken and what they're going to receive and what's promised to them, the words have to be read in order for them to know my will. Jesus said, whatsoever you ask in my name, Whatsoever you ask in my name, whatsoever you shall say or ask in my name, it shall be done to you, shall be given to you. Then we go and catch that passage there that says, according to, we ask according to his will. Well, we got to marry those two things. Because he said, in my name, then it says that we ask according to his will. John wrote both of them. So, Mr. John, St. John, Apostle John, can you help me? When the Holy Spirit stepped in to help, he turned us to Revelation, and the Bible says, and then we saw one who was wearing a robe or his vesture looked as though it was dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. So if we want to ask in Jesus' name, we have to ask according to what the Word of God said. That's his will, and we're guaranteed. He hears it, and we're going to have what we ask for. That's just a little nugget to teach you how to pray. That's why you don't hear me say in Jesus' name. It's not. He didn't say that for a tag for us to put at the beginning of the prayer and at the end of the prayer. In Jesus' name, amen. That ain't qualified you to do anything. A heathen can get out there and say that. What qualifies that is that you are saved and you are in Christ. You are in Jesus' name, number one. And number two, you're asking according to his word. The Bible says that even when we're faithless, he is faithful because he cannot deny himself. He is his word. John 1, 1. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. He is His Word. So even when we are faithless, because He dwells in us, He resides in us, God is there, He cannot deny Himself. The Bible says He's sure to perform His Word. He hastens to perform His Word. All right, here we go. That's just a little nugget. I hope that seed got planted. Because we're talking about living by the principle of seed. Here we go. Here we go. We see in these passages in Genesis the word seed, or we see the principle of seed. But what is seed? Mr. Webster says it this way. It is the grains or ripened ovules of plants used for sowing. The grains or ripened ovules of plants used for sowing. We get, we understand now that there is a time period even in women that the Bible says that they're ovulating. 
ovules. It is a perfect time to do what? To plant seed. If you want to produce children, that is the perfect time for them to come together. The second one is the fertilized, ripened ovule of a flowering plant containing an embryo and capable normally of generation to produce a new plant. You don't have time to write all this down. Just rewind the video. You can buy the CD, but we're not making any right now. A developmental form of a lower animal suitable for transplanting. Progeny, i.e. seed of David. Who was his progeny? Who went to the throne right after David? Solomon. His seed. A source of development or growth. Now all of these are packed into this message. All of these are packed into these scriptures. Because he says, fill and subdue the earth. How are you going to feel unless there's growth or development? <clears throat> it appears that these definitions may just have answered all of our questions. But let's see what the definition and description we find in the Hebrew language in which the Old Testament was originally written. The word seed in the original Hebrew is the word zera, and it means fruitful plant sowing time. Posterity, the line of individuals descending from one ancestor. Those who come after in time. Zara means seed, sowing, seed time, harvest, offspring, descendants, posterity. It also refers to the process of scattering seed, the process of scattering seed. This is Zara, the word Zara, Z E R A, by the way. Or sowing. Look at this definition. Looking at this definition, we see the results of seed and or the act of distributing seed. We look at seed, the results of seed, and or the act of distributing the seed. There's another word, and this word, this word that we just saw, Zara, Z-E-R-A, is derived from a similar Hebrew word, Zara, Z-A-R-A, which means to disseminate, to spread abroad as though throwing seed, plant, to fructify, or to bear fruit, to make fruitful or productive. Hmm. To sow or yielding to be the sower. Bearing, conceive, see, or set. Zara literally means to sow, to scatter seed, to make pregnant. Wow. I believe the Hebrew dictionary and Webster's dictionary, between those two, we could almost conclude this teaching. But... Not yet, because by all accounts, we must study and learn what the Bible teaches us about seed and the seed principle. Now, I'm going to pause right there, because when we get this, we're going to learn something, and we're probably going to really dig deep into this over the course of the next few weeks. Whatsoever a man sows, that he shall also reap. If that farmer goes out and decides he wants corn, he can't plant seeds for tomatoes. He can't plant seeds for tomatoes. And you have to be careful not to plant everything so close together. Because, you know, tomatoes are basically, you know, they're kind of vining. You know, a tomato plant, if you've ever seen one. And she might start going across the wrong way and get right next to that corn stalk and Grapes have seeds. Apples have seeds. Peaches have seeds. Some have big seeds, little seeds. 
We know one seed that's the smallest seed on the face of the earth because everybody likes to quote the verse that has that in it. If you have faith of the grain of a mustard seed, I always like to move people like, yeah, that's cute because you can move the mountain from here to there. But if you go ahead on and grow up a little bit and get off that mustard seed faith and grow up like the, like the seed is supposed to be doing and produce that plant so large that even birds can nest in it, you can tell that mountain to be removed and cast into the sea. Everybody like to stop at the mustard seed. Want to know why? But just what I said at the beginning, they ain't growing up yet. They're not growing up yet. They're still, for God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son. That is true, and that is the foundation, but that's only where they are. So guess where their faith level is? Mustard seed faith. They're moving mountains from here to there, but I still see the mountains standing in the way. I ate that bigger seed. I ate from that seed after that plant grew up. And watch, okay, now I don't want to see this mountain ever again. So when I throw it over there into the sea, it's going to the bottom and nobody can retrieve it. It's impossible. So you can stay at mustard seed faith, or you can go ahead and say, faith, come by hearing and hearing by the word of God, get in the word of God, grow up and study the word, and then you'll say to this mountain, if you say it and believe it, be removed and cast into the sea. This is just, I'm just playing seed. I know I sound like I'm just random all over this message, right? Because I'm just scattering seed. I want, as we go along with this, for you to learn how to take things and receive it and, and let it be planted there so it can grow up and you can produce a harvest in your life. Let's shift our attention back to Genesis 1.11. Everybody there? To begin this exciting adventure of powerful study that will have an unlimited impact on producing God's word and his will in your life. God designed the herb that re reasserts his divine design as it affirms that these things most certainly come to pass. Look at verse 11 here. It says, Then God said, Let the earth bring forth grass and herb that yields seed, and the fruit tree that yields fruit according to its kind, whose seed is in itself. In other words, God said, I'm going to create one of everything, or I'm going to create a thing, sort of be created two apple trees or just one. Seems like the way he was doing things, it was just one of each kind, right? Because then the process began from his command of yielding seed. To be fruitful and multiply. I packaged within you everything that's going to cause you to replicate, to duplicate, to reproduce, and to continue to multiply. And I love that. I love that God is in the multiplication and not adding. You're talking about seed planting. How about the day of Pentecost? 120 went into the <laughs> upper room. Peter spoke, scattered seed all over that crowd. 3,000 people were saved. God multiplied. From 120 to 3,000, you do the math. <clears throat> Verse 12 reasserts his divine design as it, as it affirms that these things will certainly come to pass. God commanded everything to yield seed that is within itself. The, verse 12 says this, and the earth brought forth grass and earth. Now he just said in verse 11, I'm creating this and I'm creating this to do this. What happened? Perfect obedience to God. And the earth brought forth grass and earth that yields seed according to its kind and the tree that yields fruit. So whose, whose seed is in itself according to its kind? And God saw that it was good. It was obedient. It did exactly what he wanted it to do and what he created it to do. <clears throat> Even with the devil doing his usurping in the garden, plant life still does what God wants it to do. It didn't pervert his original design. People have a hard time continuing in that vein. I will speak about that later. Because one thing we need to realize, if the seed stops getting planted into the ground, the ground that it was designed to be planted in, to produce or reproduce, human life will soon cease to exist. 
dummies, you talk about genocide. <laughs> Keep on thinking your acts of LGBTism is woohoo a great thing. You're only committing suicide for the entire human race. If everybody in here in the world right now just snap and subscribe to that agenda and snap started aborting babies all over the place because the government says it's okay 100 years max every person on earth will be dead it wouldn't, it wouldn't even last why because there's no reproduction there's no planting of seed into the ground which God designed for it to plant and the animals will still go on obeying God and doing exactly what God said. And the plants will continue going on doing exactly what God said. And there's the thing that God gave dominion on the earth. Because they had an idea in their head, wanted to follow sin and pervert themselves. And then homosexuality runs rampant. Babies are being boarded for the ones that are currently present. And if, if all the whole world just turned into those two agendas, every human being on earth, society will cease to exist. And Satan's agenda will be accomplished at that because he knows he can't defeat God. But if he could just wipe off of the earth the image of God. That's why God is so staunch on murder. That's why he's so hard on the shedding of blood. That was the first thing and the first reason why God instituted human government. The first thing he said, he said, and now Noah, if man sheds man's blood, his blood shall be shed, not by me, but by man, human government. He said, because for I created man in the image of God. So when my image is starting to be destroyed, that one that's trying to destroy my image off the earth will get destroyed. Christians stay out of the picket lines when it comes to People going to the death, but let God handle that between him and his government. We know there's perversions in the government. There's humans there. Fallen human beings. Many not saved, not knowing Christ. But we need to pray for the individuals that are facing the death penalty. And we need to pray for those who are in charge of the judicial system and the magistrates and the prison systems. That are overseeing these things so that they get it right. But stay out of God's way. That's his government. You want to do something concerning God's government? Run for office. And for those who say Christians shouldn't be running for office and, and, and being in politics. I submit to you that the Bible says when the righteous rule a nation flourishes. People rejoice when the righteous rule. So who are the righteous? I'm told in Corinthians that we have been made the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus through and by our salvation in Jesus Christ. That's just another nugget. Let's keep going by seed. Planting another seed. Food for thought. Hmm. The word yielding or yield or yields, it's also... In the above mentioned word, Zara, it is also that same word. So we got seed and we got yielding, and that is also the word Zara. Let's look back at that definition again. Zara means to disseminate, yielding, to spread abroad as though throwing seed, yielding. That means giving out the seed, producing the seed, spreading the seed, to plant, to fructify, to sow. And here's the word stuck right in the middle of the definition, yielding. Simply put, the word yielding simply means to spread, to plant, and to make fruitful. So when we see it yielding its seed, that means giving up its seed, giving it out. When you come to yield, you give up the right of way to the other vehicle or to someone walking across in front of you. So you yield, you're giving up something, you're giving out, you're giving space to. You're actually giving when you yield. You know, uh, just contrary to how we probably would think about it as it's written in most places. Well, that pretty much sums up the botany plant life kingdom.
But what about the animal world and humans? Can we find more on this question in Genesis 1, 20 through 31? Upon further examination, it is obvious that the word seed is omitted in these passages. Nevertheless, I submit to you, it is still present in principle. Hmm. When we see it written and commanded by God in verse 22, and what do he say in verse 22? He says this, he said, And God blessed them, saying, Be fruitful and multiply, and fill the waters and the seas, and let the birds multiply on the earth. That is still the principle of seed planting. Or the principle of seed. For all the fowl of the air and water creatures to be fruitful and multiply is yielding seed. Fast forward to verse 26. And Elohim commands the man to be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth and subdue it. And have dominion over all living creatures in all the earth. And all the earth. Not over all living creatures in all the earth. It says over all the living creatures and all the earth. What a beautiful thing for God to give us that responsibility. He created it and then said, now I want you to take charge of it. I want you to have dominion. I want you to rule this place. I want you to rule it under my standard operating procedures. We call that in the workforce SOPs. You ever worked in a place that had SOPs? Some of us have been assigned to write SOPs when we're in certain management positions and team leaders and, okay, what's it going to be? It just may be one little special project. And this SOP is only going to be in, in, enacted or in effect for six months while the project is going on. But here's the standard operating procedures for this. You must wear this. We must use this. Point one. Blah, 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 and we write the procedures like a script or a rule on how to get this thing done from beginning to end. Mm. As we observe scripture in verses 24 through 25 gives us the creation of the beast of the field, the cattle, and creeping things, all animals that roam the earth. Here too we see that the word seed is not used yet the phrase, according to its kind, is used and conveys the principle of seed planting and seed producing because it falls in succession from herb life to bird and fish life and to human life. So it's gapped right in between there. Being sandwiched right in the middle of all of this, seed and harvest principle applies. So just because you look at verse 24 and 25, let's look at it. It says, then God said, let the earth bring forth the living creature according to its kind, cattle and creeping thing and the beast of the earth, each according to its kind. And it was so. And God made the, the earth, excuse me, the beast of the earth according to its kind, cattle of the earth according to its kind, excuse me, and everything that creeps on the earth according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. He didn't say be fruitful and multiply. He didn't talk about yielding seed. He's already done that. He's already done that. The next thing is he talks about the creation of man on the same day that he created all animal life. And then he caps it off with be fruitful, multiply, have the mean and subdue the earth, replenish and fill the earth, be fruitful, multiply, replenish and fill the earth, and have dominion. He goes there at the end capping it off from where he started with plant life to human life. So therefore, everything he said about the animals that creep on the earth, it all applies. Seed, harvest, the principle of seed. Please meet with me at Genesis 1, verse 3, verse 6, verse 9, verse 11, verse 14, 20, 24, and 26. Meet me right there for just a second. And that's it, folks. There you have it. <coughs> the seed principle on the earth ordained by God to perpetually produce and continue life on earth. But I submit to you, 
that message ain't over. That's only the beginning. In fact, that's not even the beginning. Look at those verses with me in Genesis. <clears throat> Genesis chapter 1, verse 3. What does it say? Then God said, <clears throat> verse 6, then God said, verse 9, then God said, <clears throat> verse 11, then God said, verse 14, <clears throat> y'all see it again, then God said, I'm going to read every one of them, verse 20, <clears throat> verse 20, then God said, Verse 24, then God said. Verse 26, <clears throat> then God said. Now, out of, out of all of that, I didn't see one time, then God did. Then God said. Because from the God says, the, did, the dids got done. The doing took place. <coughs> then God said. We see Elohim do something. The same thing repeatedly in these verses. What did he do class? He said. Absolutely. Thank you. <coughs> and whatever he said. That's exactly what he got. forward just a second and let us create man in our image and according to our likeness. Man will be able to behave and do just what I do. I'm going to give all the foundation and then all man has to do is okay, let's keep going. <clears throat> Imitate me. <coughs> See, whatever God said, that is what was produced from the words that he spoke. Just like a seed which was cast out and spread by the hand of the farmer or the sower into good ground, into that which was perfectly prepared and conditioned to produce a harvest or whatever was desired to be created. <coughs> now, the farmer needs to throw seed into good ground. We're going to find that out in a later series. Well, God gave seed into good ground. He gave it into good ground. Because on the first day, God said, let there be light. All right, here we go. Here we go. He had to prepare the place to receive that which he wanted to plant and grow and produce a harvest. <clears throat> that light on that first day was not the sunshine, nor was it the moon and the stars. <clears throat> Look at the verses again. Then God said, let there be light, and there was light. It didn't say, then God made. Then God created. It says, he said, light be, and light was. Then God saw the light, that it was good, and God divided the night, the light from the darkness. God called the light day, capital letter, and the darkness he called night, capital letter. So the evening and the morning were the first day. Now, in a better teaching down the road or a more in-depth teaching down the road, that light was Jesus Christ. <clears throat> God put Christ, his word, on the scene the first day so that there will be light. Remember light. Light, light is this. Light is energy. Light is power. Light is heat. Take a few chickens that are, that, 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 or some hens that, that lay eggs. <clears throat> And if you don't have them hens sitting on those eggs so that they can hatch. I remember my grandparents having a chicken coop. And in, the, in one part of the chicken coop, there was a couple of places of nests sitting there that over them were lights. Stuck those eggs up under there. Inside of that egg was a little chicken ready to be born. Stuck them up under that light, dropped that light a little low. You know, they had to set it just right so it don't cook the, cook the egg, but it's got to produce, it's got to be there. So the power and the energy and the light produced the heat that it took that that mother hen would produce by sitting on that egg. And after a while, you see a crack in that egg. And after a while, you see a little hatchling come out of that egg. For that heat, that power, that light, that energy source brought forth life. 
It was the perfect conditions for everything that wanted to be produced to be produced. Jesus Christ, the Bible says, is the light, of, is the light and the life of men. Look at John chapter 1. He is the light of the world. He is the light and the life of men. God had to put his power and energy on the place first. In order that everything else he wanted to create, because if he hadn't done it, then day two through six was just for naught. It would have been impossible. It had to be fertile ground. It had to be the right prepared place to cast the rest of that seed out. God said, God said, God said, God said, God said, and to give him exactly what he was looking for. Let's make another example. You go out here, this vacant place, this vacant lot of land, nothing there. Running down the side of the road near that lot of power lines. But somebody says, I want to buy this land and I want to build a house here. Bulldozers and everything come and clear off the land. They're getting the land, they're trying to get the land straight. And there's power in them too. There's fire being produced in the cylinders. There's power. No power, they don't move either. But the neatest thing is we can pay more attention to now the land is bare, vacant. And nothing can happen. And then somebody comes out from the power company. And they run a line from the main power line on the road. God. We had to picture it. And he runs and he puts a smaller pole there with a utility box on it. Plant that thing. Shoot the fire to it. And guess what happens? The guys that want to build a house now have power to plug into. Until there's power on the scene. Until there's light and energy, nothing can be built. Now all the saws, drills, everything can work. Generators can be plugged in. Power generators, electric generators, or whatever tools that need to be used. Because someone now has said, let there be light. And light hit the scene. And now work can be done. You don't think there's light in that pole, stick your key in one of them little power sockets and find out. When them sparks come out through your hand. So God cast seed in a place that was fertile and prepared to produce life, to produce everything that he wanted to produce. God created us to live by the seed principle as well, not only by the physical, tangible seeds from plants or the loins of male species of humans and animals, but by the spoken words, moreover by speaking his word. Ephesians 5 and 1 commands us to be imitators of God as dear children. The first thing to imitate God is speaking words into the atmosphere. And most importantly, speaking what he has said. So speaking words into our atmosphere is one thing, but then speaking, to what, speaking what he said. You can't lose. You can't miss with that power. Remember, speaking his word, you're speaking his power. For I'm not ashamed of a gospel, his word, which is the power of God unto salvation. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am the light of men, and I am the life of men. Power. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians, or 2, 2 Corinthians, that he is the, no, 1 Corinthians, that he is the wisdom of God and the power of God. And he's the word. So when we speak the word of God, we're speaking the power of God. All right, is that, did that get planted? Hope it did, because I went over and over in that road, dropping seed in there. I hope, it was, I hope it was planted. I hope right now somebody's got power. The first thing to imitate is to, again, speaking words into the atmosphere. God spoke words into the atmosphere, and then moreover, speaking his word. His word won't fail. It never fails. It must begin with words. For I don't believe that anyone in this room or by way of social media has ever physically seen God do anything. I, I hadn't seen him jump down in front of me and physically handle anything. But what I read is he said, and whatever he said manifest or materialize. 
And when we speak what he says, wherever we have lack in our life, that gives us that creative ability to be according to his likeness. That gives us that ability to be imitators of God as dear children. I saw my dad as a kid growing up. I'm just going to talk about that imitator and how it got produced. I studied my father. I watched my daddy play baseball. Years and years and years till I got to where I was like six years old and started to play baseball. Played t-ball, a little t-ball team. Had my hat on whichever way I wanted to wear my hat. And all I could do while I was standing there getting ready to hit that ball off that tee, because Daddy was always practicing with me throwing the ball. So I figured if I can hit the ball with Daddy throwing it, I'm going to cream it off of this tee. And all I was picturing was my not only my dad throwing me the ball, but my dad hitting the ball. <clears throat> Got to get your knocking knuckles together. And man... A journey in my life started to where it finished in two years of semi-pro baseball as an adult. Because I imitated my father. Growing up as a little boy, that age, a little bit younger, it all started. I sit in the cab of this big vehicle called a truck. And I watch those hands shift through the gear patterns. And I'm over there pretending and imitating those shift patterns while daddy's driving and shifting. At age 16, daddy threw me in the driver's side of a, of a rig with a 10-speed road ranger. He didn't have to, all right, now when you start shifting, you got to start here and you have to start here. My daddy threw me over there in that seat. He said, keep your eyes on the mirrors. You're going to keep this truck in the middle of the road. That's the only way you're going to keep this truck on the road. You got to drive by your mirrors. Don't drive by the front. The trailer and the truck are not always perfectly in unison. So keep the trailer on the road and out off the center line, looking in the mirrors, I'm going to go to sleep. And he turned around and I popped the clutch and went on. Because I was imitating my father the whole time. By the time I got to an age of maturity where I should possibly be able to know something about it, he already knew. I don't have to show this boy how to shift this truck. And I'm going down the road in a tractor trailer loaded with goods. Hey, my dad had a 68 Chevelle. Wonderful car. If anybody knows anything about cars, it was beautiful. A little drag strip up there. Well, not a little drag strip. Major drag strip in a little area called English Town, New Jersey. And I watched my daddy drag race. Night after night, whenever we went to the track, I watched him race. I don't want to say, but he's old enough now. The police ain't going to come after him. I watched him race on the street. You know, back in the late 60s, early 70s, you could do that. And, you know, sometimes the cops might even block off the road for you. And I was a part of that action. High revving motors, big sound, big tires, smoke, speed. I mean, it's electric. And I watched my daddy. I watched my daddy. I watched my daddy. I'm building my second race car now. Pretty nifty, huh? How many of you ladies in here imitated daddy or mom? I mean, there were things I imitated my mom in. Either way, I imitated a parent. How many of you cook because you saw your mom bake this way or stovetop cooking or, or, or frying? Or How many of us have handy things like, I watched my dad fix everything. You want to know one thing my wife don't know a lot about? Calling somebody into the house to do a service. Refrigerator, boom. The dryers, I can't tell you how many drivers, dryers, and washing machines have I repaired in our lifetime together. Because I watched my daddy go in there about blowing himself up sometime, fixing stoves and washing machines and refrigerators and dryers. The cars, no brainer. No brainer. Best mechanic I ever knew was my father. I watched him and I imitated him. I have been earning income. For the last nine years consistently, eight year, eight or nine years consistently, through and by tools being turned on vehicles. <laughs> and before that, since 1975, <clears throat> guess where I started at? In Daddy's shop. 
Are we getting this? So now, here we are. We have to pay attention to God. Because he's our father. And we have to be imitators of him as dear children. So that when he wants us to go ahead and take the seat and take the wheel and put our hand on that 10 speed or that 13 speed shifter, he's already, we've already, we've already watched him. We've already studied him enough that now we can walk. We can drive that ring. Some of us are still waiting for God to do everything for us. He's already done it for us. We have to get in his word so we can now work the tools he's given us. Yes, he's still the power that does it, but you have to do it. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Who do you give that command to? Is he talking to himself that that's what he's going to do for us? Or did he tell husbands? Love your wife as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it and sanctify her by the washing of the word. Are we going to wait for God to take care of sanctifying our wives? Or are we going to do what he said do? Are we going to have a mess on our hands if we don't do it? There's always going to be some chaos in the house. Well, Lord, you created her. Why ain't you doing something? I've been praying. And God is sitting there going, why aren't you reading my word? You should be doing Faith without works is dead. All right, here we go. Let me finish this message. We must learn how to live by this method, by the principle of seed, by this one principle. When we come back together, we will really begin to peel open the who and what, where, when, why, and how of living by the principle of seed. It is going to be life enriching if you stay tuned and receive what the Bible teaches us on this subject. I'll leave you with this reflection. Death and life are in the power of the tongue. Just reflect on that. And those who love it will eat of its fruit. Proverbs 18, 21. You and I have the ability to produce life or death by what we say. Your speech, our speech, can cause us to live or it can cause us to die. Or is that, did I not read that just now? Death and life are in the power of the tongue. It can cause us to live or to die. We can advance up and forward in life or we can digress and deteriorate. How many of us know people that are just meandering around through life aimlessly? Seemingly no purpose, no hope, doing the same things over and over again and failing over and over again because they're in the same place over and over again, hanging around the same people over and over again, hearing the same things over and over again, watching and receiving into their system the same things over and over again. Even some of them took knees around. Most of them just sit on the dashboard of the car and the coffee table in the house and the nightstand next to the bed. Saved and born again, but no one has ever taught them what I'm teaching today. Just floundering. And it's sad. And I do my best. I was in conversation with people some this week. The circle and the cycle and the circle and the cycle of beat down and run over. It's just... <laughs> And then when they want to talk to me, it's just they're in dire straits again and again and again. But they won't show up here and hear the word of God every day or every Sunday. They refuse to be, not only stay in the word themselves, but refuse to be instructed by the person God gifted to teach them the word. Pastors and teachers. <clears throat> You're not going to get it all on your own. If you would, God would not have ordained that office. For those of you who like to stay home and think you don't need to go to church. You're not called to be that teacher. If you are, you need to be in a building sharing it with others. Or you need to be out on the streets sharing it with others. You need to have some people congregating around you. Jesus had congregations. He walked the streets and he had congregations. He didn't go into a synagogue and a temple. Every city at that time in Israel and in all of Judea had synagogues. Read the book of Acts. They all went in there, and Paul and the apostles went to synagogues in every city, the Bible says, 
Because that's where they could catch the Jews at one gathering so they could have a congregation because they needed to teach the things of God. Go find a fellowship that is Bible teaching, Bible believing, Bible teaching, and, and helping people grow. Please. Because when you don't, then you just, then you, all you did was just tell, tell yourself and tell your family and whatever else, the Bible ain't true. I don't need to go there. I was up till 5 o'clock this morning finishing this little two-page message that I had started almost one whole page three weeks ago. You don't think that's a gifting from God? I'm at 5 o'clock in the morning. I'm up at 8 something in here now teaching. That's a calling from the Lord. Get yourself in front of the people that have, God has called to do this and devoted themselves to it. We don't do this because we want to take control of your life. We want to do this because we want your life changed. And because it's burning inside of us. <laughs> Jeremiah says it's like a fire that's shut up in my bones. I can't hold it all in. And while God's packing it into those who are gifted or, or called and chosen or ordained to teach, be the receiver. It's okay to receive from somebody. When we walked into church today, I was listening to a nationally well-known pastor. The message was so good. When we got into church, I Bluetoothed it into our sound system so everybody for at least the 15 minutes or 20 minutes before church started could hear some of that message. I sit and listen to other pastors. Scriptures of no private interpretation. We all need each other. We're the body of Christ. Don't be that stay at home, I don't need church Christian. You're doomed to failure. You're doomed to all kinds of sorts of ideologies and doctrines of demons and philosophies of men to start entering into your mind and having mixture with the word of God. Now you don't know what to believe. You believe in stuff that they say that's contrary to scripture and, and you just don't know what to believe. You, you say you believe in the word, but it's, it's difficult because all these other disturbances, all the, uh, these other sounds are coming in. I know I've been there, done that. I burned that t-shirt. So I see people out here now just Flounding, being blown and tossed about with every wind of doctrine. And I get these phone calls. <laughs> Leave the message on my voicemail, because sometimes when I see it, I don't, I don't answer it. I know you may think that's me. No, it's not. Because I know it's going to be the same thing again. Now, let me tell you something. Jesus kept it moving. I need to get to the people that are hungry for the word and desire to hear. When you decide to walk away and not to come in and make certain you're continuing that feeding, you hear part one of a six-part message, then you don't show back up for the next five weeks. And then you look around and people's lives are flourishing like flowers. They're buying homes and cars and the families are, are expanding and they, the old relationships that have been torn up are being rebuilt. And and, and they're, they're the favorite person at their job and, 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 and just keep, promotion is coming and <coughs> they're active in the community and people are sitting and you wonder, well, why is that happening with them? Why doesn't that happen to me? Because you won't sit still. My wife will tell you one of my greatest mottos. And anybody in my life can look at my life and tell you one of my greatest mottos. Any good teacher is, be, is willing to be a good student. If you cannot be a good student, you're not going to be a good teacher. You can't lead your family the right way until you become a good student. Somebody's got to pass it along to you. You were not the first person created in the earth. Somebody else had to pass it all the way down. How do you think Moses knew what happened at the beginning? I used to be an international adjudicator and, 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 and instructor for national and international musical organizations. Traveling the globe, world renowned, right here from little old North Carolina, man, I was, I was among the elite of the world in music and performing arts. 
And sometimes I would go to a place where the, there's a clinic or a whole weekend of, 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 a, of, a, of a, um, a meeting. We call them sometimes uh, trainings or teachings or, or, or colleges, seminars. And I would go catch the plane out of my own pocket. Nobody's paying for it. Get there, go into the room, sit at a table out there in the middle of everybody. And some of the national and international instructors and other teachers and stuff that are around going, so what part of this are you teaching? I said, nothing. <laughs> what are you doing here all the way in Boston, Massachusetts? You live in North Carolina. What are you doing here then? Sitting next to you getting ready to learn something. Wait a minute. You are. You just spent a whole season on tour adjudicating my organization, telling us how to do it and get it right. And you're sitting in here to, I, absolutely, I don't know everything. So I'm going to sit down and learn some more. Do you want the advantage when I talk to you? Or do you want to walk away from that competition that you're in going, man, he didn't say a word. He didn't teach us anything. I didn't get anything out of your tape. Tell you what, when you come into my critiques, that's something I've never heard. I didn't get anything out of I got more teaching jobs out of contests that I judged, giving some of them some of the hardest positive constructive criticism, but having to give them numbers that were low and, and, and hardcore criticism, I've had my phone ring say, excuse me, what are you doing on particular days of the week? What do you mean? Man, I've never had somebody give me a score that low, but when I heard your tape, I got to hire you. Never have I heard anyone walk away and say, I didn't get anything out of your tape. I didn't get anything out of your, 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 your critique. And within a few days, I can see that organization again, and there it is in the stadium, on the field, on the court, on the floor, in, the, in their performance. And then when I see them in critique that night, they'll say, we took it back and we worked exactly on what you said. How did it look? How did you? I said, I knew it right off the gate. I said, they went and they listened and they did exactly what I said. They did exactly what it's I saw the problems and issues that could and it all and everything connected and the performance was better. Why? Because I want to be educated. I want to continue. For those of you who think you're gonna be the one man game, keep going. You choose what you're gonna do. Life or death, that's in the power of the tongue. As for me, I will refer to Deuteronomy 30 and 19. When the Lord God said, I set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore, choose life. And listen to the result. That both you and your descendants may live. I think that's a no-brainer. We're going to continue with this series next time we're together. Father, we thank you for all that has taken place in this room today. We thank you for your word and the power thereof. We thank you that you have given us something to chew on, something to meditate on, something to think about. We need to understand what seed is and its purpose and why it's designed to do what it does and what it does and the benefit it has to us and how we can do the same thing and be active in yielding seed in our life. Thank you, Father that you've encouraged us and admonished us and commanded us to be imitators of you. Now teach us, Father, how to imitate you with our tongues, with the words that we speak, with planting seeds, with planting physical seeds, financial seeds, verbal seeds. We're going to learn how to walk in this kingdom and we're going to learn how to live in this kingdom according to how you have given us the standard operating procedures. We love you, Father. We thank you for helping us to understand. Thank you for those who have been obedient to you by coming to sit in under instruction. The Bible says that only a fool refuses instruction. Those who are instructed and receive instruction are wise, but those who don't are, I, I take it back, brutish, your word says, or let me say stupid is what that translates to a little further. Help us not to be stupid, but to be those who will receive instruction so that we can walk in wisdom. We love you, Father. We thank you for your word today. We give you all the honor and the praise because you are worthy. We ask that you will 
oversee and bless the offerings and the tithes that have been given. We thank you, Father, that you're multiplying it here in this place. We ask that you will bless in abundance, uh, exceeding and abundantly above all that we can ask or think, according to the power that works in us, those who have given. We ask that you will give to them good measure, pressed out, shaken together, running over. It will give, be given into their bosom, and shall men give into their bosom. We ask that those who have tithed and given offerings, Father, that you will pour out of the windows of heaven, being faithful to your word. Windows of heaven blesses that they have not room enough to receive, and that they are faithful in their giving so that they're not caught robbing God. We love you. We thank you. We give you all the honor and glory. Amen. Thank you once again for those of you who have joined us by social media. We do turn to you and let you know that we are New Beginnings Celebration. We do let you know that you can contact us by email, nbcelebration at yahoo.com. You may call or contact us through 252-670-1153. That number has really changed for the church, but right now that's what we're going to use. That's my phone number. Uh, if you have any questions or concerns about the message, or you can go to our website at nbcelebration.com. We thank you so much once again for taking time out of your busy day to join us. Refer back to this message at any point in time. If I went a little fast for some things, take your notes. Study this. Join us again for the next section. You don't want to miss the next two or three parts of this message because it's going to make all of this explode and connect. And when you get to the other end, I'm telling you, your name will be Peter. You will walk on water. Thank you once again. We'll see you next time.